When you spend your whole life born and raised in one denomination of faith, it is really hard to see past the biased lens of the organization you're raised in. And I was one of those dedicated in the church around the age of two and grew up and married and had kids in one denomination of faith. And my daughters were the fourth generation in this faith. Yeah. And it was very hard to see past the biased lens of what had been taught in the denomination. Um, and having always been molded to the conformity aspect of pastoral preferences uh, and having those things constantly justified that the man is the head and the pastor is the head. So your father's the head, your husband's the head. And at no time are you to question the head. You were supposed to be in absolute obedience to the head. Yeah. So if their preferences uh, were stricter than the other pastor, even though it was still the same denomination. You were to just change your uh, appearance, your clothing, the way you raised your kids, your activities. You're just supposed to drop anything that didn't match that pastor's preferences. Growing up and living um, in that environment my entire life has made it very hard one, to find and understand me as an individual. I was already pressed into that mold of conformity that left me limited and devalued just because I was born a woman. I didn't choose my sex. God defined me as a woman when I was born. But because I was defined by God as a woman, I was thrown in a category of not being as significant or of a value in relation to men in the organization. Uh, later in life, uh, really from late elementary school, all through high school, uh, young adulthood, there were a lot of incidents of sexual harassment and inappropriate comments uh, inappropriate touching um, that occurred in my life. And all those things were, again, um, not recognized as being an injustice to me as an individual. I, in the school system, because there were some things that happened in school, in the school system, it was just regularly laughed off or brushed off, you know, oh, the guy just likes you. You know, and I was telling my daughters that. So if you would go through the hallway and some guy would pinch you on the behind or he'd intentionally throw himself into you so he could pin you against the locker and touch you, you know, um, teachers and principals would always laugh and make it off as, well, they just really like you. It's a compliment. No, it was an assault and an, and an insult. It was a combination of both. You know, it was a, an overstepping of respect of an individual um, for for self-pleasure and gain, if not for humor, you know, at, at the young lady's expense. And those things were regularly an issue uh, growing up in the schools when I was younger. It was very common. Um, in, in church... Uh, it, it, it was the same thing, you know, uh, pastors would regularly make comments on the pulpit that devalued women, made it clear our place was in the home. Our place was tending to the kids uh, and our husband at any expense. Um, we didn't have a right to say or um, stop anything in respect to uh, the right of marriage in the bedroom, you know, um, whatever the husband wanted, it, it was up to you to supply. You know, it, it just, um, uh, was, it was just taught and fostered in us from childhood, you know, and, and it was done in ways that usually were very subtle 
and they always utilize scriptures. Uh, but looking at it now, now that I've had time to grow and, and come in contact with more knowledge and education and, and diversity of people and faith, um, I can see now how they just pick and chose, you know, it was cherry picking, if you will, uh, little pieces of doctrine scriptures that they built a doctrine off of, you know, and they were always uh, out of context that it was not what the chapter was talking about. And every time in the first marriage, there was a lot of abuse. Uh, I had can't honestly say that my first husband uh, even realized he was being abusive. I honestly don't know that he, he knew or seen that in himself. I really don't know. Um, where the, the church fostered such a mentality and, and taught so much in respect to men and women roles and that uh, real distinction between genders and stuff, I don't know that he ever understood that anything that he was doing was abuse. Yeah. And then it was even more uh, of an issue because uh, my husband had a mental health issue. You know, he was a severe bipolar manic depressive disorder. Yeah. And um, because he always had the mindset that he was going to become a pastor, uh, a leader in the church, um, there was a lot of strictness as to I had to look a certain role to fulfill everything that was required of him so he could rise in ministry. Um, and uh, that was a lot of burden. And his ways were my ways, uh, no matter what. You know, there was no communication between us. There was no compromise. It was, this is what it is. And, um, and it was very damaging to not just my physical body, but my mental, my emotional, my spiritual man. Uh, and, and from that moment on long term, you know, ongoing ripple effects from being raised in one denomination of faith that really devalued on gender, you know, and, and that's really all it was. When you're in an atmosphere that pushes those differences between male and female, um, pushes conformity, it, it's a lot easier for predators to be in the congregation and to even rise up in positions of leadership because it's very easy to look a role on the outside to get acceptance and permission to rise. If you have money and means to take their classes and licensing, uh, it, there's nothing to hold you back. Yeah. And before long, you have an organization and churches that are literally headed and geared, um, operated uh, completely under predators. Predators. And, and that's, that's one reason why I will not promote or encourage anything uh, with my organization of childhood faith, which is the UPCI. I won't do it. And you have, even in the news today, of, of incidents where uh, women are coming forth regularly of being um, sexually assaulted you know, by leadership. And then the head of the organization and uh, the... Um, I'm just going to leave it at the head of the organization talks about how um, it, it takes time to change things. No, really, it doesn't. It really doesn't. You know, um, you're not a big corporate company making money for profit and you are the house of God. It should not take a long time to make changes for the betterment and safety of people. And if you have to take a long time to make those changes, you really don't care. You know, uh, it, it might be um, hard to make a shift of that's really fast. Make it. You know, you can you can tighten the reins in the sense of making those changes and shifting the church fast and and toughing it out a year or two. Why those things are are uh, really you know 
sucking it in and tightening the rein to, to make sure people aren't hurt anymore. You know, you can toughen it up and get it done faster. But this mentality, it could take a while. We have to go through all these processes. If the organization is so set up that it's going to take that long uh, to go through loops and hoops and scoops and everything else, um, trash the organization and start over. It should not take a long time to do what's right. It should not. And even uh, organizations where they have a very stringent voting system when it comes to things that are flat out harming the men and women of God it should not be a matter of majority vote if you know that this is not working and people are being harmed by what is in place it needs immediately addressed and it should not take years and years and years to address it if it takes a long period of time you don't care you don't care and the fact that things have happened so many times in the UPCI, and I can even sit back and look at my life, my friends, my childhood, my young married life, my present life, and see how things have been handled from the beginning to present. And I'm 47 years old. You have no interest in the best for the people you're just interested in protecting your idol of an organization. And, and I just, I can't deal with that anymore. You know, I don't know how many times I tried to talk to pastors and their wives in, in counseling um, as to different things that I've experienced. And every time, every time that phrase uh, of don't, don't touch God's anointed, you're not to touch God's anointed, was thrown in my face. And and every time it was thrown up that that I was the woman and, and, and that was the man, you know, I was supposed to respect and honor my head, whether it was my husband, my father, my pastor, you know, those things were thrown up. And the, the verse, touch not my anointed, is in the Bible two times. Um, 1 Corinthians 16 and 22 and Psalms 105.15. And both verses are exactly the same in the King James Version Bible. And it is not in reference to men as being the head. It's in reference to the Israelites, God's chosen people, and Him having delivered them. And they are to go forth and talk about what the Lord had done on their behalf and going forth and sharing the glory of God to the people. They were His called, His elected, His chosen and I am one of those in the New Testament church. And it was never appropriate for any of the pastors and their wives to look at me and devalue me as I wasn't God's anointed, but the pastor and the husband and them whom I was trying to get counseling for were. In that moment, you didn't even understand the word. And you surely had no respect toward the hurt that I had endured and what was occurring in my family. And that that's... That's unacceptable. And organizations that have to take a long time to make the changes that are necessary to safeguard and protect people from harm do not care about people. They care about their image. And I will never be a part of those things again. Ever. Ever.